So what I'm thinking about this seminar, I've just, I think about it as e-records management 101. And I would like to provide some information for the symposium, an introduction to the symposium, and what we hope to accomplish today and how we got here from my point of view. This program is the work we've been doing over the past couple of years on campus to improve the way we manage records in digital formats. These efforts involve the Chancellor's Communication and Resource Center, CCRC, Information Services and Technology, IST, and University Archives. CCRC was interested in, in finding a way to manage, to create, file, retrieve, the rapidly growing volume of records, correspondence, email, documents, reports, images, in a wide variety of formats, text as well as multimedia, created in various types of software. ISNT is interested in developing and providing standardized software solutions and support to manage CCRC's digital records as efficiently and economically as possible. University archives are in, in, interested in ensuring that CCRC's inactive permanent records, the special class of records CCRC no longer needs for daily business and which for administrative, legal, scholarly, or historical purposes are destined for transfer to the archives for permanent secure storage. Our efforts involved other units on campus as well, including some already working with IST solutions and some who have been developing their own solutions involving proprietary or homegrown software. So our intention today is to present a summary of what we've been developing and learning over from these efforts. The initial step today, call it e-records management 101, is an introduction to the issues, problems, and some actions and solutions that we've encountered in our way. We hope the program will develop the audience of campus resource records creators and managers who are here today, represented by you, who share the same problems, tasks, and goals that we do. A bit about the audience itself, as revealed in the survey form, which is in your packet today, I think it showed some interesting information. And I think it's a useful starting point for building on what we do today. The survey of types of electronic files created shows no surprises. Email leads the pack with nearly 90% of, of, of respondents. But a, but a sizable number of respondents report creating more complicated files to manage, including blogs, websites, wiki updates, and podcasts. The second question, who has primary responsibility for electronic records in your unit, had an intriguing response of 22% for not sure. Uh, whoever you are out there, I'm really glad you're here today. <laughs> And if you're not sure, we're not sure, and that really makes us anxious, because we, we need to know who is creating, for the archives purpose and the future uh, history of the university, we need to know who's creating records that, that need to come to the archives. You need to know who's creating records for your use. Which software do you, do you use revealed Microsoft Excel or Access leading the pack with 78%? Not a big surprise. But the complete list of software included more than 26 products. I'm surprised it wasn't more. But 26 plus is problematic enough in terms of developing standardized solutions and methods for capturing those files for current permanent archival storage. I was also intrigued by the response to the question, do you apply the UC retention and disposition schedules, with nearly 66% replying in the affirmative and 34% negative? I'm astonished by the number of affirmative, particularly since, if you didn't know it, those schedules are woefully out of date, and they really are not doing what they're intended to do. Uh, but happily, we're going to hear more about that today. UCOP is leading the effort to revive the, the system-wide records management committee and to revise and bring up to date the, uh, the records disposition schedules, which are the key critical planning tool that should underlie everything we're doing in our offices today, because they tell you what this record, what type of record it is, and what you do with it, when you dispose of it, when you transfer it to the archives. It's a critical planning document that we are going to get updated. But those 66% who use them, I think, will be very helpful in that revision process. And the archivists plan to work with that group and with UCOP to get this essential planning tool revised and in place for all records on campus. And of those who didn't know about, who haven't used the records management schedule, I'm curious to know, I was curious to know, well, how many even knew that it existed? I think probably a sizable number of people weren't aware that there was such a document. Also interesting was the 21% not sure responses to the final question. Do you have files stored on external media which are not also stored on a local server? Concerned as I am as archivist about the essential, critical, permanent records that should end up in the archives, it's important to know the answer to this question, if only to be certain that pertinent records are stored securely. Our intention then is to provide an introduction, an overview, as 
which leaves little time, little time for formal discussion today, but I think it's clear that we have plenty to talk about and we hope to further that conversation with a couple surveys following today's program as well as uh, some future programs on these topics and we'll have a chance to talk a little more in detail about that during the wrap up at the end of the day. So that's where we are and where we're headed today in my humble opinion and I'd like to know, are there any questions or comments before we get started? Okay, Kathy. Thanks, David. Well, we're kicking off uh, the day's sessions with, um, with a block of sessions relating to the records management life cycle at Cal, uh, starting with a discussion of legal issues and the records retention and disposition schedules. Our first two speakers are from the Office of the General Counsel in the University of California Office of the President, UCOP. Stella Nye has served as University Counsel since 2010. Her primary areas of practice are the California Public Records Act and Political Reform Act, which is part of the state's conflict of interest law. Cynthia Vroom is senior counsel at UCOP, where she has worked since 1998. She's a member of the litigation and educational affairs sections, handles litigation matters, administrative hearings and subpoenas, advises on e-discovery and legal issues related to records management, and advises uh, privilege and tenure committees system-wide. Our third speaker, Stephen Lau, has been Director of Policy for Information Management and Technology, also in UCOP, since 2010. He's responsible for system-wide IT policy and information management issues, including privacy and security concerns. So we will first hear from Stella and I. Good morning, I'm Stella Nye. I'm with the Office of the General Counsel in Oakland, and as I've mentioned to some of you, I'm so glad to be here, thank you for having me. It's always a treat for those of us at UCOP to get to come to the Berkeley campus and to such a lovely building today. So, as Kathy said, uh, one of my practices is the California Public Records Act. And some of you may be familiar with FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. That's the federal law. And CEPRA, the California Public Records Act, is the state version of that law. It was modeled after FOIA. So that's one of my practices. And that means that I, you are all my clients when it comes to public records. Uh, I advise the campuses, my fellow colleagues uh, in campus council office, uh, members of the Board of Regents, faculty, staff on public records issues. Some of you may have, and I know some of you, have experience with Public Records Act requests, but for those of you who don't, I'm just going to briefly talk about how uh, the Public Records Act is, again, modeled after the Freedom of Information Act. And in fact, our state legislature declared that the conduct of the public's business is uh, that the public has a right to know how our public agencies do business. So that's why it might be a shock to some of you who have come from the private sector that when you come to UC, uh, because you work for a uh, a public agency that many of the records you create, many of the documents that pass through your email, your hard drive, the networks, documents laying on top of your desk, in your file drawers, in your cabinets, even the little scribbles, even the little notes you write during meetings are all generally public records that are disclosable to the public upon request unless there's an exception. And um, yes, again, I know, I realize it's somewhat of a shock to people who are new to the university that, wow, my salary's public? The notes I took in this meeting, agenda, agendas, meeting minutes? Yep. So that brings us quickly to issues. I've been asked to talk about issues that arise in this area. And as you can imagine, there are many. Um, well, one thing I want to talk about is in relation to this forum, uh, one of the best things that people can do in preparation for getting that Public Records Act request, as many of you have gotten them, some of you will get them, 
is to follow your retention practices and the retention schedule, which I know I'm not the only person who is thrilled that the retention schedule will soon be updated. And let me tell you why. It's, it might be an obvious point, but when that Public Records Act request comes in, sometimes they're written in an extremely broad fashion. They could ask you for, I would like all the documents and all the correspondence from that project you worked on for the last two years. So real life example, sometimes it just takes getting one of these, right? Uh, a particular client, uh, I'm not gonna mention any names, had fielded such a request for all documents on a particular project, and there were boxes and boxes. And now I know many of us, especially over the last few years, because of different things, retirement, positions not being filled, and layoffs, many of us are doing more than we used to, right? So the Public Records Act is the law, and all of us have a responsibility for complying. And really, I, I have to say, I want to take a minute to say that I'm very proud of the robust Public Records Act function at UC, at this campus, and at the other campuses. UC produces tens of thousands of pages every year in response to this law. So I have to say, I get a little annoyed when I see some people in the news talking about UC not being transparent, because I beg to differ. I know the people every day who are producing records and are being transparent, and they include you. We couldn't comply with this law without you records creators and custodians of records taking the time to diligently go through your records and produce these records. Now, back to that gentleman who had boxes and boxes. Well, of course, he went through everything. We figured out what was responsive, produced the records, and then shortly afterwards, when he got the next Public Records Act request, he was ready because he decided that it was in his best interest to, after the end of a certain types of projects, to make sure to go through and figure out what do I need. And he told me that he had winnowed things down to one accordion file folder. And that was his goal from then on. And I know that's really difficult, especially with all the email we create, which of course, leads me to talk about how it, I, I'm, I'm a library person. You know, ever since I was little, I love libraries, I love librarians, and I'm glad people thought to preserve all that they have and things like invitation lists. And I just think that's so wonderful. Unfortunately, of course, with email, people are regularly creating so much communications and traffic that actually doesn't have enduring historical value. And Right, and, and we know examples of this, like scheduling emails. Hey, I can meet next Wednesday. No, I can't do Tuesday, you know, and then it goes on and on and then there's a chain. Um, so just back to that point of sticking to the retention schedule, thinking about the best practices for your unit. You know, what do I need to keep for business purposes or legal purposes or for ar archival purposes? That'll put you in the best shape when you get that Public Records Act request. Uh, I was asked to talk about what do you do if you get a Public Records Act request? Well, here on campus, you are in excellent hands by calling Leanne Coe, who is sitting right there. You want to wave, Leanne? She is your campus Public Records Act coordinator, so she is your first stop, and Leanne will then work with me or my colleague in OGC, Maria Shanley, as needed to decide what records of yours are public. And again, um, you know, sometimes portions of records can be redacted under privacy laws. And that's another area of practice that we do at the Office of the General Counsel, privacy laws. So Leanne would be your first contact. Uh, feel free also to contact me. Again, Stella and I, I'll leave some business cards. And my colleague, Maria Shanley, also practices in this area. And she's actually the specialist on FERPA and Information Practices Act. And also for resources, uh, being mindful of time, on the OGC website, there is an FAQ. There are FAQs about public records. There's a guidance document called the ABCs of Public Records. And uh, I welcome you to look at that. And again, to call me if you have any questions. Do we have time for questions, or should I? Right on time? OK, thanks.
Good morning, all. I am Cindy Vroom. I'm also with the General Counsel's Office. Um, I am really grateful to be here today, and I'm grateful for the interest that Berkeley is showing in um, electronic records management, because I think it's a really critical topic. Um, at the Office of the General Counsel, I am a litigator by trade. I do give general advice on <clears throat> electronic records, but I, I am a litigator, and unlike Stella, who uh, sees things at the front end of the process. I see things at the back end of the process when they've gone south, when the lawsuit's been filed, when there's a subpoena. So I have sort of a different view of what can happen when records management uh, goes awry. The principal areas that I deal with um, with respect to electronic records in litigation are e-discovery, subpoenas, and lawsuits involving the Public Records Act, and there's a, a fair amount of each. So the, the question has been asked, what are the kinds of issues that come up? Uh, with respect to e-discovery, um, and I don't know how many of you have been involved in e-discovery or even know what it is, e-discovery e is basically the step in the lawsuit where once a complaint has been filed and the parties exchange uh, all relevant information, the law now says that the relevant information you exchange has to include electronic information as well as hard copies. Uh, there's a lot of controversy when that new uh, federal law was passed, but really the goal is, is not a bad one. It's, it's, it's really the same uh, as it's always been in litigation. Everyone has the right to see the other side's relevant information. It's just that in the, in the old days, you know, when electronic information was sort of coming to the fore, people would say, oh, well, you can't have these records because I don't have them in hard copy form. They're all in a database, and they would avoid their obligations in litigation. And the, Congress finally said, no, 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 can't have that. So uh, e-discovery e is simply the turning over of all relevant information in a lawsuit. So th the issues in e-discovery are first, how far, well first actually, where are the records? And that can be really complicated. And I, I think we're sensing the beginning of a theme here today, um, which is records can be anywhere in the electronic world, and they are tending now to be everywhere in the electronic world. Email is just mushrooming. Uh, different departments have records stashed in different places. So the first question is, where are the records? Then the second question is, how far do you go to preserve them for litigation? Now, when you've got um, a very large number of electronic records, you've got an issue. It's going to be very costly to preserve them, and it's going to be time consuming to try to find them. With subpoenas, a subpoena is, is a third party request for records, and it's very similar to um, occasions when the university is a party in a lawsuit, but this governs cases where the university is not an actual party to the lawsuit, but has relevant records. So you have the same issues, the e-discovery rules apply, you have to find out where all the records are, who has them, and how do you produce them. Uh, in litigation, uh, with respect to PRA litigation, um, you know, uh, Stella really talked about the problem of volume of information. I see it on the back end as well. Uh, PRA, as Stella was sort of s suggesting, it's, it's an unfunded mandate, and the volume of PRA requests can be so large that, you know, campuses sometimes have trouble responding. I can pass on the one sort of nugget that I see on the back end. I see a number of lawsuits where they're brought under the Public Records Act to force the university to cough up the records. And the reason we haven't is simply because no one has responded to the requester. Um, you know, there's not a statutory time limit for actually producing records, but what I see in these lawsuits is where uh, public records coordinators and records managers can be just overwhelmed with volumes of requests. They say, well, you know, they say to the requester, well, we think we can get you the records by this certain date, and then they don't, and then they don't correspond with the requester, and when I get the lawsuit, I, I see the exhibits lined up, and they're increasingly frustrated letters from the requester, who is frequently a lawyer, saying, you promised, where are they? No response. Well, you promised, where are they? No response. And then, okay, if I don't hear from you in 30 days, I'm going to file a lawsuit. No response. You know, those are the kind of cases I don't like to see, because we basically have no defense, and we have to pay the uh, attorney's fees of the person who requested them. So that's the biggest issue that comes up in lawsuits uh, involving the um, Public Records Act. I think 
what I, the, the common denominator in all these, of course, is, as I see it, is volume of information. The electronic age has just seen, is no secret, uh, everybody here I'm sure has experienced it, just a mushrooming, a nuclear mushroom cloud of volume of records most of which is kept, some through sheer inertia, even though, as you know, Stella was talking about, oh, you're free next week. You know, there's millions and millions of bits of information like that that are squirreled away in our electronic records depositories. And it creates a huge problem for a couple of reasons, at least on the litigation end. It's incredible, well, and not even, not even on litigation. It's, it's expensive to store. You have to take care of it. You have to protect the data if it has personal information in it. It's hugely expensive to produce in litigation. And uh, it's just sort of the, the tidal wave that's, that's uh, running over us all. So my, my advice to everybody is, you know, and this is the current best practice in records management, is only keep what you need and only keep what you really need. And when the day comes that you don't need it anymore, don't keep it one day longer, but destroy it. Uh, you know, there's different needs for information. There's, you know, as Beata was saying, there's historical and archival uh, interests, and that's up to some of the folks in this room to make those determinations. But there's also the huge, huge stash of non-relevant, outdated, sometimes non-record um, bits of information out there that are just sitting there, and they're all open to discovery. Um, my best story about this was <laughs> I went to a certain campus which shall remain unnamed to assist them in an e-discovery uh, effort and much to my horror went into uh, the office of, of a certain administrator and he opened up his the cabinet behind his desk and there were like stacks and stacks and boxes and boxes of CDs containing every single email he had ever sent or received. Every, I've never seen anything like it. I just. <laughs> I was just hyperventilating, and I was like, <laughs> so, um, you know, the, the rec everyone, I, I think we've already heard a couple of people talk about the records disposition schedules manual. It is a huge problem. I know Steve Lau, wherever he is, is going to be talking about that. Oh, there he is, momentarily, so I'm not going to say too much about it, except to say, from a legal standpoint, it is just woefully, woefully outdated, and I am among the people that are thrilled that there's going to be uh, an effort to update it. If, if you're looking to, but it is the binding policy for the university, and if you look at the records disposition <coughs> schedule and it doesn't have on it the topic or the document that you need to make a decision about, the, just use your best business judgment and keep it as long as you have a business need for it. So uh, those are sort of the main points I wanted to make. We're sort of we're out of time. I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to go into this in more depth, but I'd be happy to answer questions offline, and I plan to stay around for the morning. Thank you. to bend the microphone a little bit closer. How's this? Is the microphone better? Great, thanks. Okay. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Lau, and I'm, the, uh, I'm from the University of California Office of the President, and I'm the system-wide director for information management and also information technology policy. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, I am responsible. <laughs> I get asked that a lot. So um, I have a, uh, I wear several different hats. Um, one of the areas that I wear is, is I'm responsible for all information technology policies, which includes things like the electronic communications policy, um, the information security policy, IS series, and also the records management policies, RMP series. I'm not sure if how many of you are familiar with those, um, but uh, those, are, those are what I'm responsible for, and I work very closely with all the campuses and also with um, the records, management's, records managers across the campuses to, um, uh, to keep, try to keep those update and to try to do interpretations for them and see, see what um, directions that the campuses want to, want to go in. Okay. A little bit of background about myself. Um, I joined OP back in 2010, but prior to that, I was at UCSF. And prior before that, um, I was at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So I have about 16 years of UC experience. Uh, so I've been around a little while, I guess. Um, 
Uh, so I wanted to uh, thank David for inviting me here um, and uh, to give a little bit of talk about a couple things that we're doing, that I'm doing at uh, OP. Um, I want to reiterate a little bit that, uh, that we, theme that we've already heard already this morning is that um, we live in very interesting times, uh, especially in the uh, records management and archivist um, area. Uh, you know, there is, there is a, there are, um, we're all becoming essentially records generators in, 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 in huge forms. I mean, all of us. We send emails, um, we send instant messages, we send video, audio, et cetera, et cetera, and all of those essentially are becoming records in, in forms that did not exist previously, and they're becoming extremely easy to create. I mean, we all have cell phones, we all have Kindles, we all have laptops, et cetera, et cetera. And um, these are all records generators, and the records are, are winding up all over the place. Um, one of the things that I, I, I found to be very interesting is, I'm not sure how many of you all know about it, um, but uh, Twitter themselves are, um, has been donating all of their twi tweets um, to the Library of Congress. Um, so every single tweet that you've created or will be creating is being stored in the Library of Congress and being made available to everybody. Uh, for those of you who do not know, um, President Yudoff actually has a Twitter feed, um, an official UC California Twitter feed. Uh, and he posts on it fairly regularly. A lot of them are pancake recipes, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he does post to those regularly, um, and we also have, um, you know, a University of California Facebook website, and you know those things are. We also have a YouTube site, um, and a lot of the campuses are doing exactly the same thing. A lot of the chancellors themselves also have Twitter feeds. They also have YouTube sites. They also have Facebook sites, um, and these things are just going to be increasing uh, in, in in magnitude um, as we move along. Um, so the question becomes is how do we preserve all this stuff? What do we do? What are the guidelines for that? Um, what is, when is it official? When is it not official? All sorts of types of challenges in that way, okay? So um, there is, see, um, and the other thing that, uh, that is going on is, as been, be, been uh, stated for several times already this morning, is that the uh, records retention schedule is woefully out of date. Um, I was surprised as well as with David that um, with this answer here on the survey, uh, that 66% of you, approximately, are actually using the schedule currently. Um, that was actually surprised me. I thought it was, <laughs> thought that would be actually a lot less. <laughs> um, but then there's also 34 or 35% of you who are not using it. Um, the uh, the records retention schedule is woefully out of date. It has been updated um, probably in about 20 years or so. Um, and uh, uh, you know there have been legal requirements that have been um, that have developed since it's, since it was last time it was revised. Uh, there have been a lot more best practices that are now out there. Uh, like I said, there's a lot more forms of records that did not exist um, uh, when this thing was created. Okay? Uh, so essentially, it, is, it no longer um, fits the modern day era and the needs of the university. Uh, and it is, a, it is a sprawling document, and it reflects our sprawling nature of the University of California and how diverse and how um, unique each of the campuses are. So um, here at the, uh, the Office of the President, we're actually launching a project, uh, a couple of different projects. One of the ones is that we revitalize the Records Management Committee. Okay? Each of the campuses has records managers and is also archivists. Um, we've, we've revitalized it um, all the records, so that all the records manager, managers at the campuses have a forum for them to discuss and also for us to plan um, to tackle some of these issues that, that we're facing. Okay. Archivists have um, a seat at the table, as long as as well as OGC and compliance, um, and uh, you know it's really dri driven by the campuses and the needs by the campuses themselves. Okay. One of the largest projects, the larger projects, that, the short-term projects um, that we're going to be tackling is to update the schedule itself. Okay. It's a very large project. Um, the uh, the schedule itself, like I said before, is very very much out of date and doesn't reflect reality currently. Um, we are in the process of tr attempting to hire a person who's going to be a project lead to, um, to update the schedule. Uh, I was hoping that by, th this, um, by this meeting here that we would have brought somebody on board and would have been able to introduce this person uh, here at this meeting. 
Uh, we have gone through all the interviews, and through the final interviews, we're currently in the process of trying to negotiate with this person to bring them on board. So i um, hoping, keep your fingers crossed, that we'll have somebody soon um, to do the project lead on that one. And the way that we're going to be looking at the records retention schedule itself is that, um, to update it, is we're looking for somebody who, we've been looking for somebody who has experience in um, doing records retention schedules, in primarily in a government or educational environment. As you all know, as Estella also mentioned before, is that we're very different from industry and commercial, commercial interest. And we really need somebody who has that experience um, in, in an educational background to understand things such as research, things such as the PRA, um, things such as electronic communications policy, the privacy aspects of it, et cetera. Okay? Um, it's going to be a multi-year project, and um, we're going to be looking at it, um, working with the records managers to try to come up with a new schedule. Uh, we're going to be initially focusing on uh, the legal requirements, you know, whether, what we actually have to do um, in terms of the records, uh, records management. Um, and at the same time, we're going to be looking at the, some, of the, some of the categories where there's not necessarily legal guidance, uh, but we're looking at industry best practices um, in terms of a records retention schedule. Okay. We're hoping to try to get away from these ranges that we currently have right now, uh, where you see in the current records retention schedule of things like, you know, retain between zero and 100 years. Um, <laughs> we're looking to try to set some, some a little bit narrower boundaries and associated with that. <laughs> Um, so uh, that's, uh, it's going to be a, a big challenge. Um, like I said before, I was hoping to have somebody here uh, by, uh, by this meeting, but unfortunately we don't have that person yet. Um, there is a listserv that is, um, that, that does exist, um, that we've tried, I've been attempting to revitalize, is for all the records managers and also for anybody else who's interested in this topic. And um, I can uh, let people know and they can sign up with that. Um, and I'll let David know so that he can actually get this, the, the, the address of it out so anyone can, can sign up for it if they're interested in discussing this topic. Okay. Um, and the final thing I wanted to mention was also that um, another initiative that I'm working on across all the system, uh, which also ties in the records management, is um, an initiative called the uh, Privacy and Information Security Initiative. Uh, it's a system-wide initiative that involves all the campuses. And similar to records management, the whole area of privacy and information security has evolved um, and is rapidly changing. If you look at the papers every day, there's something new that's coming up in terms of electronic privacy. You know, are you tracking me? Are you not tracking me? How long are you retaining my records? Who owns my records, right? Who owns my, my, my Twitter feeds? Who owns my YouTube video? Um, you know, do you have the right to sell all of my information to, to a third party um, you know, when I sign up for Facebook? Uh, it's, a, it's an evolving field, and because of the fact that uh, UC is diving um, headfirst into a lot of these uh, new areas, um, and there's a lot of new regulations associated with different types of data, such as um, you know, health information, such as uh, personal financial information, personal information, we've looked at uh, the current privacy policies and security policies, and have noticed that they, that they don't, they, once again, they're not keeping up with the times. Okay. So uh, President Udoff has launched an initiative, as it was an 18-month 18 18 initiative, to take a look at um, what is currently, uh, where's the current landscape of privacy in an educational type of environment, and what are the best practices, and where, which direction should the university take? Okay, and once again, we're very different from industry. Um, in that area, in industry, in that area, uh, you know, whatever you whatever you say or whatever you do. Um, you know, is, is owned by the company itself, and the company has uh, all rights to look into it, okay? Uh, here at the University of California, we have the, what's called the Electronic Communications Policy, um, which says that, um, that you know, in, in many ways you need consent for that. That does not override things such as the PRA and other legal requirements, and there's a gray area and a balance associated with that. Uh, but we do, do have that, 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 um, that uh, culture of privacy here within the University of California. Uh, so we are looking at that. It's an 18th month initiative. We're getting very close to the first end of the first stage, and we're going to be generating a report to go to President Udoff, which will then be disseminated out to everybody, uh, which will reflect um, things such as uh, a uh, updating of, of various aspects of po policy in terms of privacy, which also ties into records management, and also in terms of information security of things to retain and how to retain it and what not to retain, which once again also re um, uh, crosses over into records management and archival. 
Okay. So we have a couple, those are the two major initiatives there. Um, I'm at the Office of the President. I am always there. I'm also always available if you have any questions regarding the RMP um, policies themselves. And similar to the, um, the actual record schedule, the RMP policies are quite old, and some of them are out of date also, so we'll be looking at those too. If you have any questions for, about those policies in terms of what you're reading, feel free to contact me, and if I don't have the answer, I can either um, uh, work with you to contact either OGC and or also some of your um, colleagues at the other campuses who, who are doing similar things with you, um, like you, and may have an answer in that way. And um, so hopefully you'll be hearing more about the uh, schedule. Uh, it's gonna be a long project. Uh, as it develops, you'll hear more updates on it. Um, and uh, that's about all I have for this, and I have two minutes. Um, thanks. <laughs> I also have cards. I'll be here the rest of the day if, if um, you have any questions. Okay, thanks. I'd just like to ask for another round of applause to our, for uh, our speakers today, Estella, Cynthia, and Stephen, for their informative sessions. Thank you very much. Well, next we're going to hear about compliance and risk management issues. Uh, we're fortunate to have Linda Morris Williams, Associate Director, or I'm sorry, Associate Chancellor for UC Berkeley, here to introduce uh, the two members of her staff who will be speaking during the session, and she's going to um, be speaking as well. And yes, um, Associate Chancellor Williams uh, administratively oversees several offices, including audit and at advisory services government and community relations and the staff ombuds office and serves as the campus chief ethics risk and compliance officer among her other roles. Associate Chancellor Williams. So good morning, everyone. I, I had to laugh as I was sitting there because almost everybody that's come up is, is a, um, certainly a colleague and, and some certainly that we work on a regular basis. And sometimes somebody said to me this morning, one of my colleagues, it's good not to have to talk to you. I said, that's really good. I'm happy to hear that also. <laughs> So again, welcome. I'm glad to see everyone in the room this morning. I too would like to take an opportunity to thank um, the planners for today. This is a very exciting and engaging conversation that is due. There's a lot more to still talk about. I certainly hope that as we continue the conversation, both what we have to share and what you've heard from the previous speakers, that we don't get discouraged from creating records because we are talking about both legal aspects of this, we're gonna talk about the risk and we're gonna talk about compliance. But I think Beata certainly did, as did David and others, give a great opening to talk about the real reality of the historical nature of being able to tell our stories when all of us are somewhere other than here. And so that's really important, but what we want to do and what you've heard thus far and what my um, colleagues here will say is to make sure that we give you as many tools in your toolkit to be able to do it knowing all the elements of what that means when we are creating records both in writing, um, hard copy, and from a digital perspective. Um, our presentation is going to be along the lines of what you've heard a little bit about already, but we want to focus on compliance and risk management, and then the public interest that you heard around public records, um, and really talk about um, it a little bit from where you began, because um, my mother used to always tell me wherever you begin is where you end. So if you kind of started off a little bit doing it the way you wanted to come out on the other side, then you have a better chance of maybe getting it right. Um, it was interested to hear about all the tweeting and the texting and the emailing and the Facebooking. I don't do nearly none of those. Maybe because Public Records reports to me and I get a full view every day of what's out there. So I just say, okay, I think I'll take a pass on that. Um, but it is a new world and it is a new environment and we're trying to um, make sure that we understand the complexities of it and go along in that fashion. Um, 
you heard a little bit about in the introduction that um, in some of my roles, and one of those is about a year and a half ago, out of the Chancellor's Office, we established the Office of Ethics, Risk, and Compliance Services. And the intent of the office is to serve as an independent and objective resource to the Chancellor, campus leadership, and the campus community. Uh, we are responsible for coordinating and monitoring the university's ethics, enterprise risk management, compliance activities, and for developing a culture of accountability in which risk assessment and risk management are part of all campus practices and decision-making activities. It assists functional managers, many of you in this room and certainly many across the campus, with mitigating material risk, complying with the law, regulations and policies, and just adhering to the ethical standards of the university. Our efforts are in close partnership with Audit and Advisory Services, um, which also reports to me because in, the, in doing all of that work, looking at the law, the regulations, and also um, looking at audit, they come together and they touch each other every day. And so it's important for us to work together, and so we've been doing that. With that said, I'm gonna introduce the team members here up at the table and um, let you know who you'll be hearing from. Jamie Jew. Jamie is currently the Associate Director in Audit and Advisory Services Group here at UC Berkeley. Audit and Advisory Services is an independent appraisal activity. Appraisal activity, I know it doesn't feel like that sometimes when they come in, but they are appraising. I just want to take a plug for them right here. Within the university for the review of accounting, financial, and operating systems as a service to management. The objective of internal auditing is to assist all levels of the university management in the effective discharge of their responsibilities. Prior to coming to UC Berkeley, Jamie was director at KPMG LLP's forensic practice in assisting organizations to proactively identify and assess risk associated with fraud, corruption, misconduct, regulatory compliance, and records management. Jamie will discuss challenges and the top risk associated with records management at the university and our compliance responsibilities with state and federal laws regarding record retention and disposition. And then we also have with us Leanne Cole. Leanne Cole is currently, as you heard earlier, our records management coordinator, including public records, and joined the chancellor's office in February. Uh, her responsibilities include the development, coordination, implementation, and management of the university's records management program and managing public access, access to all university records. This joint responsibility also includes providing advice, information, and training to departments regarding records management. Leanne has over 15 years of campus experience on the Berkeley campus, having worked previously in university relations as a GIF administrator and in student affairs as an operations manager and human resources management. Hence, her records management experience covers a wide range of information to include gifts, donors, alumni, financial, and human resources. Leanne will discuss looking forward, both from a current perspective of what we're doing, but also more looking forward, which is the goal of our objective here in this day, and challenging some of the efforts that she has to oversee. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Jamie. Great. Thanks, Linda. Um, you know, I'm with the Audit and Advisory Service Practice here at Berkeley, and I wear many hats. And so one of the hats I wear is as the auditor, one of the hats I wear is investigator. We also do investigations. And another hat I wear is, consult is the consultant or advisor to management. And I had wore similar hats when I was at uh, KPMG, my prior uh, employer coming, before coming to Berkeley. And one of the large projects I worked on at the time was we had a client that was looking to implement an electronic records management system. And strangely enough, they were actually larger than the UC system. They had about 300,000 employees. They operated in over 70 countries. Um, and so what I'd like to do is talk about some of the challenges that they were facing and things that they were thinking about, about managing their electronic records. Uh, they were kind of in a similar situation to what we have here at the UC system, relatively decentralized. They had operations that were, were creating centralized records as well as records that were being produced in individual units and individual countries. Um, so you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, the challenges that that uh, that organization faced um, and what they were thinking about moving to the next step of implementing an electronic records management system. Um, you know, recently in the headlines, you know, records management has come up as an important issue. Uh, one of the things that has been in the headlines is the PG&E um, pipeline explosion, which happened in San Bruno two years ago. 
Uh, and strangely enough, there's been a lot of inquiry about the maintenance records and the inspection records for those pipelines. And uh, pg and had a little bit of difficulty finding those records. And you know, this is from the Chronicle last month that uh, you know, PG&E reported that it's, it's recruited employees to look through hundreds of thousands of documents that have been set up in the Cow Palace, um, you know, South San Francisco. And it's, that's certainly something that we don't want to have. We don't have the time or the resources to do that. Um, but, you know, kind of where are we for the UC system? You know, I, I looked on the UC website. I was looking through the, the, um, the records management uh, retention schedules. We have 1,309 currently record series or types of records. Um, when companies are thinking about implementing records management systems and having the ultimate creators of the records declare them at the time that they create them, which is kind of the, you know, the, um, the goal or the holy grail, um, what would that look like for you? See, would you have a pull down menu that would pop up and you'd have 1,309 <laughs> items and they'd have to scroll down and figure out, okay, I think it's record 1306. Um, so it's something to think about. So you know, I'm going to walk through the, the stages of uh, records, uh, a life sti si cycle, and talk about some of the challenges that occur, both from a central standpoint, but also from an individual unit standpoint that's creating these records. So the first thing is, you know, what is a record? So we create a lot of stuff here as part of our business that we conduct for the university. And the technical de definition in the risk management policy is that the policy applies to administrative records. And I won't bore you with the definition, but basically that relates to the conduct of the business of the university. If it falls outside of that, and there's a little bit of judgment, there could be some more guidance provided perhaps, um, then it's not a record. So as you're, as you're conducting your business, you know, really taking a critical view as to what is a record and what is not a record. Then later on there's a, there's a point where is this a record or it's, that can be disposed or is this something that, can be, that needs to be archived? That's something that happens later in the cycle. Um, and then if it is a record, do I have the authoritative copy? Let's take the example of an email. In email, you have at least two copies, the person who sent it and the person who received it. Which one has the, the copy that should be kept? for the purposes of our, our record retention schedule. If we clear that up, then you could reduce by half the number of emails that are kept on the campus. Um, what goes along with that is who is the office of record. Um, typically, you have, uh, you know, you have, in our record series, we have descriptions of the types of records. But in each of the 10 campuses, um, plus OP, plus the agricultural um, units, it might be a different uh, unit that has that record. The goal, of course, is to, at the time the record is created, if it needs to be identified as a record, it needs to be declared. So it can be tracked going forward. Uh, right now, we have a manual process of declaration. The way industry is going, it's more toward auto declaration. For example, if I am creating a, um, an invoice, um, there are programs out there that may, that can scan for the activity that I'm doing and say, looks like you're creating an invoice. Would you like me to archive that? Or, or sorry, declare this as a record. And then it becomes tracked. Okay. And then it becomes tracked, and it can be followed through its life cycle as a record. Now, at this point, if we're going to track it as an uh, electronic record, we need to know the metadata associated with it. And I don't know if, if people are familiar with the term metadata as it applies to electronic records. So it not just relates to the content, but who created it, the date it was created, if it is a record, what series of record it is, so we know what retention schedule to apply. Um, and if we're, we're not creating our metadata in a way that's standardized, then it's very hard to be able to bring it all together and to track it potentially centrally. And then on top of that, we're use, we have lots of different systems that are creating records. And you know, one of the goals uh, in many organizations is identifying which systems, electronic systems out there, are, are creating records. And if I'm not going to move records out of that system, I'm going to leave them in place for their life cycle, then I need to declare that as a system of record. And I, need to, I can't be updating that system. I can't be deleting things um, or moving things out there without 
consideration of preserving that record. Moving on to the, to the retention portion of the life cycle, you know, we have, from a business perspective, you have a need to identify when, when do I need uh, more immediate access, this is an active record, I need to call this up on my computer, or when can I move it to inactive so that you, maybe you move it to a second tier of storage, or maybe it's not immediately, um, you, you don't need to be able to call it up immediately, but it can be an archive, it can go to a reporting tool, like a bears. Um, if it's financial data, for example. And then if I do move it to some sort of other medium to store it, how am I gonna be, is it gonna be structured or unstructured? Are you familiar with the term structured or unstructured with respect to data storage? So for example, structured could be like an autonomy system in which they, the system takes the metadata, it applies it, it captures it, so you can search on it, you can search for, show me every document, every record that Jamie created in the six month time period. And it can pull up, show me all the records in series 45, for example. Then you have things that are, that are more unstructured. So you have some semi-structured like SharePoint or BSpace in which some of that metadata may be, may be um, uh, tracked, but you don't necessarily know what record series it belongs to. You don't necessarily know how to apply a retention schedule if it's not capturing that information about the record. And then you have the unstructured data, which is like a, network drive or an unmanaged space where you're just kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, putting documents in there, but not really tracking it in a way that can help uh, manage the life cycle of those documents. So let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the hot topics that, that I've come across or seen uh, in terms of risk areas. One, are, one is managing records in transactional systems. So for example, let's take the example of an invoice. So we have BFS, which is essentially PeopleSoft, and it generates invoices, or will generate invoices. We're, we're developing that, that module. So when you're generating an invoice, you have information about a vendor, you have information about prices and dollar amounts and POs, and these may all come from different tables within the BFS database. And it may be trans transmitted, it may be put together in a nice little form that we, that we mail to our client, or it may be sent electronic, like in, through an EDI interchange. If we don't actually generate a paper invoice, then what is the record that's being created? If someone were to ask us, can you, can you produce the invoice that you sent to XYZ? Well, we don't actually, we may not have retained a copy. So in thinking about our business process, do we actually want to print something out and then scan it and then store it as an image? You know, that's a, that's a bit of a trade-off there. Um, we talked about email. Uh, you know, I think one of the challenges is we're going to be moving to a new email platform um, through Google. And how are, we going to, how are we going to apply retention there? How are we going to be declaring records and tracking records? It's not physically going to be here at Berkeley. It's not going to be on one of our servers. It's going to be at Google. Um, talked about uh, Another thing is, is IT systems. We are constantly updating, sunsetting, bringing new IT systems online. What happens if we take something offline? Let's say we're, gonna, we we're looking to retire PPS uh, eventually. You know, are we gonna migrate in a way all of the records off of that? Or are, we gonna have, are we gonna have to actually physically keep the mainframe up and running just in case there's a, there's a record request that comes in or a public information request that comes in. We have to boot up that system and create something from 20 years ago. You know, that's another question. And then um, the goal is really that most organizations are looking for is enterprise search. And that is, you know, something that organizations are struggling with. Is it possible to have a master database or place where you know where all of your records are, that you can search them. Show me all the records that Jamie's created in his career at Berkeley over the past, whatever, five years. Show me all of the, um, all the timesheets that have been created for this, for this particular college. Um, and to get to that point, we really need to start thinking about, you know, are we standardizing our processes? Are we identifying records at the time that they're created? Shared services, I think, is an opportunity. Um, to perhaps consider that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we're running out a little bit of a time, but, you know, cloud services, social media, 
our websites, all the content on our websites and how we treat that, um, I think are, are challenges that not only we're facing, but most other universities and, and large complex organizations are also facing. So there are a lot of risks out there, but you know, I'm, you know, my understanding is that there are a lot of very smart people working here at Berkeley and throughout the system on that topic. And so um, from an internal audit standpoint, we're very, very um, eager to hear how that gets uh, addressed. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Great. Now that I have your attention, I just want to say thank you, everyone, in advance for answering my email or phone calls when I come knocking on your door because your department has received a PRA request. Thank you so much. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, where we are today and where we would like to be in the future. Now that I have your attention, I do have a confession to make. I used to be a pat rat. I kept every single piece of paper I touch. Don't ask me why, but whenever I need reimbursement, I make a copy for myself, I give it to my supervisor to sign, she makes a copy for herself. If it needs to go to the flight transfer office, they sign it, make a copy, um, before I even leave our door. So I thought, for whatever reason, I would be able to retrieve that information, because what if I need that information? It might get lost at someone else's desk, in a department, what if I never get to the person? Where, how am I getting my money back? That I have a copy handy. So at some point, my supervisor was wondering, Leanne, why are you spending more time under your desk than actually on your desk doing work? Well, it's because since I'm keeping every single piece of paper in a really small cubicle, I overwhelm my work surface and you're fully, fully utilizing my under my desk to keep all the paper. <laughs> For some reason, I thought I could find that piece of paper when I need it. Obviously, that's not true at all. So, in regards to that, I want to talk a little bit about efficiency, risk, and also access in our daily operation. Another great example is that um, in the fundraising world, when a donation comes in, our major gift officer would love to make a copy of the check. I would make a copy of the check because I need to process that donation, and a communi communication person would also make another copy of the check for publication purposes. There's three identical copy of the single document before leaving an office, and that haven't even reached the cashier or university relation for processing. There's a huge security risk because those are all the private information from a donor, such as a copy of the check, the home address information, the credit card number, but everybody wants a copy. The reason being is that the information, when we need it, we can't get access to that information. And in my central files day, we used to create very nice individually filed with different section of information. So you know that this section was for prospecting. This information is everything that this prospect wrote in his or her lifetime. But that got out of hand very quickly as well because the information we received was literally stacked and stacked of records. People at some point are not actively using that central file system because the information they need are not in the file. Even with three full-time staff, student and myself, we weren't able to manage that workload. It was just too much. Besides not having enough staff support to um, manage that workload, our floor wasn't able to handle that workload as well. We're in an old building where that space in particular was never meant to take on such heavy duty file cabinet in addition to all the paper. So the structure engineer would give us warning, give us a call, okay, I'm here to give you a visit. You guys are at maximum capacity again. So what we do, we would pack everything in banquet boxes and move it out into different location of the campus because we simply don't have storage room for the information. However, we have to apply to the retention schedule. So there's another big problem there. Um, so what about once that information is no longer active, what do we do with it? For example, in my previous role, I was the HR manager and because of the OE project, we consolidated many functions such as HR. I was horrified last July when we clustered with another service center and they came over with 100 boxes of campus moving boxes. It literally filled that space over there. I was horrified. We barely have enough space for the people. Now what are we gonna do with all these fire? Some are active and some are not. 
So what we end up doing is, uh, okay, we purge what we could, and once again, we took the same 100 boxes and move it to other storage space. I feel a little bad for the mover because we didn't have an elevator, so they have to move the same 100 boxes up and down twice. But I think that these are the typical problems that we all encounter every day. And during our daily business, we are so concerned about protecting this information, keeping everything locked, making sure that um, you know, only yourself or people who have access to it have access. But what happens when this information is no longer active and we run out of space? Those identical information we try to protect are now somewhere in the basement, in the attic, in multiple warehouse where anybody could get access to. I think our only saving grace is that since we ourselves don't know what's in there, hopefully people don't know what's in there either. <laughs> and much of the um, information about records management is all institutional knowledge. I know exactly where everything's are, but what if and I love the fact that I can just ask Cindy, you know, where is this information? You know, where do we keep this? Oh yeah, this is right over there in the third file. Saying, but what if that person no longer works for the university anymore? That institutional knowledge is lost. And also, as OE continue, as we consider continue to restructure ourselves, those record, hopefully, for better or worse, comes with us, and some may not. What happened to all those information? Because when I get merged in, a, in the department, all my records is kind of left behind. But now that department also merged with another department, I have no idea what happened to them. So those are the records that have a lot of historical value, and we also need to consider retention value, but we don't know what happened to it. Um, as demonstrated by the example I have shared, I hope that those are some of the story that you probably experienced and lived through those every day. The purpose of sharing that is to let you know that you're not alone. It's a real problem that we face every day, every day. But there are solutions that's currently available on campus that we can look into. For example, um, something that Patrick will talk a little bit about. There's um, there's CowShare, <laughs> there's um, ImageNow, and there's other low cost system that currently ISNT is offering that we can fully utilize. And simply, the way that we have operating in record management, it just will not sustain anymore because our world has changed. We are running out of space. We are running out of resources to actually manage and to actually filing the paper. We have to have a different solution for, for our daily operations. It's not effective. Why is it the same identical document needs to be copied three times before leaving in the department? There's a huge risk, risk because now we don't know where those information are and how many social security number or credit card number are floating around. It is high risk because we have no control of that information. And also, it's a vicious circle, right? Because since I have no access to information I need, I'm going to be creating continue to make copies, and so are my colleagues. So we do need to look forward to a user-friendly electronic management system that it doesn't take you long, uh, much longer time to actually electronic file this document than actually file the document, where you know exactly where to retrieve the information, and you know what's in there and what can be purged, and more importantly, more importantly, to know who have what access to that information. So we're going to wrap up. There's two things I'd like to say that I think we certainly need to be mindful of as we continue these discussions. And you've heard it from many people already and certainly from uh, my colleagues here. I think ownership, who owns the document? As it was said, you know, if you have an email and you send it to someone, but who owns it? And then they send it to someone, and I tell everybody, once you hit send, 
consider it that you don't own it. No. Um, anyway, the point is, but ownership is going to be a really important thing because from a historical perspective, you want to make sure you understand who was the owner of that initial document. And then I think authenticity is going to be another huge issue as we talk about records retention because because of all of the electronic medium that can be used to do so many different things, um, you know, a lot of people do PDFs now around documents to make sure that they don't get changed or modified by mistake, I'm sure, um, et cetera. So I really think we're going to have to include that when we think about it, because if we are talking about historical documents and archiving them, we certainly don't want to believe that we find out 20 years later that that really was not the document that was originated, uh, et cetera. So anyway, thank you very much for your time, and we appreciate all of your help. Thanks. Okay, and now to finish this session, we're going to hear from the Associate University Archivist, Kathy Neal, about the specific uh, perspective of the archives and why we're so concerned about that special class of records that we really need to keep in per perpetuity and securely in the archives. In a TV interview earlier this year, uh, performer Peter Frampton said that he preferred being introduced as a band's lead guitarist later in his career to being called a pop star during the 1970s. Why? Because a pop star's average professional span is 18 months, but a musician's can last a lifetime. What he's really talking about is short-term versus long-term value as an artist. When University Archives staff considers the great volume of institutional records being generated on a campus as large and complex as Berkeley's, we, like Frampton, also have enduring value in mind. The University Archives collects the official records. And I'm going to have my technology not work for me. Let's see. There we go. The University Archives collects the official records of the Berkeley campus and the UC system, personal and professional papers of Berkeley faculty, staff, and administrators, and non-official materials that document the history and development of the institution. More often, the archives role begins at the end of the records life cycle, when records reach their disposition period and become inactive. Now there's a major exception to this practice, which I'll mention later. But some of these official records, part of record series, are already scheduled to be transferred to the university archives if they're considered to have long-term indefinite value. And there are other records not necessarily on the schedule that we may want to keep as well because of their ongoing administrative, evidential, fiscal, legal, or historical value. It's generally thought that only three to five percent of an organization's records are worth keeping long term. And it's that relatively small amount of documentation that we're charged to collect, preserve, describe, and make available for users. The University Archives is located in the Bancroft Library, in the Dell Library Annex, one of Bancroft's uh, uh, nine collecting programs. And we have material dating back to the, found, the university's founding in 1868, plus some that predates it and documents the College of California, the institution that preceded the university as we know it today. Joseph Cummings Roll, a class of 1874 alumnus and the first university librarian, began collecting University of California printed documents during the mid-1870s. When he retired in 1919, he became the first campus archivist, a post that he held for the next 19 years. In 1964, UC President Clark Kerr designated university archives on this and the other UC campuses, and Berkeley's university archives became the official repository for records documenting the history of our campus and the UC system. Well, what do we collect? We're interested in a wide range of record formats, including, but not limited to, paper-based documents, volumes, scrapbooks, photographs, 
maps and drawings, audiovisual recordings, films, memorabilia, and of course, today's subject, electronic records, which themselves can include an array of record types, uh, ranging from email to Word documents to databases to websites, blogs, photos, and other types of AV material. These materials document the university's history and its office and departmental functions, policies, and decisions through substantive correspondence, organizational charts, annual reports, budget summaries, committee task force and working group files, and official and student publications. The major record groups documented include the UC Office of the President to 1975, early UC Regents, the UC Berkeley Office of the Chancellor, the Academic Senate, and the Office of Campus Life and Leadership, uh, to name just a few. And we also have a broad ar array of records from other administrative offices, departments, and organized research units, as well as those of student organizations. Taken together, these collections help to trace some of the major movements in the campus's history, including, as I mentioned earlier, its founding, the California loyalty oath controversy during the McCarthy era, era and actually um, in the interest of um, full disclosure, this image is not actually a university archives image, it's part of our, one of our Bancroft uh, pictorial collections, but it certainly relates to university history. It's from the San Francisco News Call Bulletin uh, collection. Um, but it also, um, documents other eras um, and, and movements, including the student protest movements, uh, including the free speech movement of the 1960s, and some of the recent Occupy activities. University Archives staff will work with you to review and survey unit records and faculty papers. We'll help identify uh, which should be transferred to the archives and prepare them to be added to our holdings in the Bancroft. Now ideally, the records retention schedule assists us in determining which records uh, to transfer to the archives, and, and we're very much looking forward to the, the updating of the schedule that uh, Stephen Lau and others have uh, mentioned uh, today um, that will be happening in the future. But we also feature a general list of record types that we typically do and do not collect in our records transfer guidelines that are available on our website or by request. We're interested in collecting the record copy of a document, and there's going to be some overlap with uh, Jamie's talk today, um, we're, which is to say that we're interested in that single copy that is designated as the official copy in terms of reference and, and preservation from the Office of Record. Often the record copy is the original master version. Because the Bancroft and the University Archives is open to the public, and the university is, of course, a public institution, we focus on collecting material that is unrestricted. Now, sometimes we do encounter sensitive or confidential material that has enduring value. And it's a great help to us if you can alert us uh, to it in advance as we're selecting uh, what should be transferred, especially given the, the great volume of records that <laughs> tend to come to us. Um, in those hopefully rare cases, we can place restrictions on portions of the collections, uh, making sure to set uh, specific time frames for opening them. And of course, these transfers are not meant to be one-time only opportunities for you. Uh, we can work with you to arrange for periodic transfers. Now, earlier in this talk, I said that the role of the university archives in the records life cycle usually begins at the cycle's end. In the case of e-records, however, we also welcome opportunities to meet with you when you're creating born digital material of enduring value to uh, offer guidance in how the records are stored and how their metadata are described. When possible, this should be a collaborative process between the records creators, uh, IT staff, and our university archives staff to make sure that the records retain their authenticity, their integrity, and can be accessible long term. This afternoon, we'll hear much more about the strategies that are now in place to preserve and provide access to digital material 
from my Bancroft Library colleague, Mary Ailings, and Trisha Cruz, the California Digital Library's Director of Digital Preservation. Once the materials come to the archives, staff creates cataloging records for them in OSCICAT, the UC Berkeley Library online catalog. They're arranged, preserved as much as needed, and depending on collection size, described in finding aids, which are guides to the collections. Some of these finding aids are then loaded into the online archive of California. Selected material is stored on site in Bancroft stacks, while the rest is shelved in the Northern Regional Library Facility, um, NRLF, which is how we often refer to it, in Richmond. And materials housed in our on-site stacks take approximately 15 minutes to be retrieved, and that stored in um, Richmond takes up to three business days to arrive for use in the reading room. We do provide a link to the online version of our, of our request form on the Bancroft Library homepage to make it easier to order material in advance. Administrators, staff, faculty, students, scholars worldwide, and the general public visit the Bancroft to use the, the archives in our reading room. And though inactive, this material can remain useful uh, for you in your work uh, because you're consulting it to see how decisions came to be made or uh, policies set. It also allows you to clear your offices where space is likely to be um, at a premium and to make way for the current records that you're creating. But university archives holdings have an even broader reach. Students on and off campus delve into them for their papers as they learn to use primary source material. University relations staff and others on campus feature archival photos in their publicity materials. Scholars use the, raw, the material as raw data to write histories about the campus and higher education. Genealogists use it to trace their family connections. Now essentially then, these um, inactive records lead second lives. So I'd like to draw this overview uh, to a close, but I would like to point out uh, two useful sources for learning more about the archival component of the records retention and disposition uh, process. One is um, uh, RMP2, the Records Disposition uh, Program and Procedures, uh, which actually spells out a bit or provides an overview of the, the function of university archives on campuses and the website for the UC Berkeley University Archives, which include links to our records transfer guidelines. While we don't need to concern ourselves with being labeled pop stars or musicians as records creators and keepers on campus, we do need to play major roles in deciding what material should become part of campus history and legacy. We look forward to working with you to identify and collect those long-lasting records. Thank you. <laughs>